many armed forces from this region uh, did take part in some of the stabilization operations, particularly in Afgan Afghanistan. But the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have been the dominant experience for this century of the land and air forces of the US and its allies. And as a result, they've changed a great deal, as much as they changed in either world war in the previous century. Uh, the wars have many lessons, and many of them are relevant to this region. For example, in uh, efforts of government to counter uh, insurgencies in the region. And the tools that were developed, the tactics, techniques, procedures and equipment, are very relevant, for example, to a military confrontation between the DPRK, South Korea and the US. Um, but there's relatively little discussion of how the characters of the wars evolve and the wars' implications for the future. So I set out to fill those gaps and look at the conflicts from a military perspective. Now, in 2001, the unforeseen requirement to remove the Taliban government from Afghanistan initially challenged US military capability, but it ultimately succeeded. On the other hand, regime change in Iraq had been thoroughly planned and drew upon the full range of US military capability. And both interventions showed that a well-trained, modernised, networked, conventional force with air superiority could defeat a less modernised and poorly trained conventional force. No surprises there. But post-conflict stabilisation saw the US and its allies struggle to align the ends, ways and means necessary for the military operations, for reconstruction and for political activity to achieve progress towards coalition, NATO and national strategic objectives. And the US and its allies came extremely close to strategic defeat. And the principal reason for this was the inadequate strategic leadership by national leaders and their governments, including sometimes defence ministries and forces chiefs. Key contributory factors included weakness in intelligence and understanding of both countries, inadequate reconstruction, political strategies, military strategy, operational concepts, tactics and equipment. Now these combined at times with failures across government and armed forces to adapt quickly enough to unforeseen circumstances providing opportunities that were exploited by their enemies. And the ferocity of the armed opposition in both countries was a strategic shock to the US and its allies. Against opponents determined to fight, international forces who were unable to fight or whose governments wouldn't let them fight were of little utility and often added military and political friction. So the wars reaffirmed that combat is the core military capability and that armed forces should be benchmarked against determined and capable enemies. It took years for the US and its allies to recognise that the ends, ways and means were inadequate. Adaptations were made that allowed uh, the US and its allies to create su sufficient security for limited political progress. But force had wide utility for the US-led regime change campaigns, and for the eventual conduct of counterinsurgency operations, which brought a measure of security. Force also had great utility for the militias and insurgents that sought to disrupt reconstruction security and further their political aims. For example, covert support for proxy militias in Iraq helped Iran achieve its strategic objective of increasing its influence there. But the widespread perception of the intractability of the conflicts and the difficulty of achieving strategic success resulted in a loss of confidence in the West of the utility of force, and the political and military credibility of the US and its allies was damaged, and these consequences live with us today. Now there's much evidence, sometimes, of suboptimal leadership and decision making in Washington DC, London, CENTCOM, Baghdad and Kabul, and this shows the vital role of strategic leadership by heads of government, key politicians, senior military officers and civilian officials. The requirement for co coherent and consistent ways of formulating strategy was demonstrated. The effectiveness of the strategy, including the utility of the force being applied, must be regularly reviewed, drawing on reports from the operational theatre, and should be tested both within the machinery of government and also against the assessments of outside experts. Strategy must balance ends, ways and means to produce an interagency plan that can be used by military commanders, diplomats, development agencies and intelligence services to formulate an interagency operational level plan from which tactical plans can be developed by all those organisations. So a political strategy is essential 
to provide the foundation for all operational and tactical activities. And of course this must include host nation governments. It must also assess the risk that the host nation governments will act in ways that make them part of the problem rather than the solution, for example due to corruption, politicisation and the existence of patronage networks. And dealing with those issues is never going to be easy, but it's likely to require a mixture of carrots and sticks. The war shows the necessity for military command at all levels, from national capital through theatre strategic, operational and tactical level. Higher commanders had to have highly developed communication and interpersonal skills, and the ability to influence a wide variety of actors. They also had to gain and sustain the confidence of heads of governments and defence ministers. So command was an important military capability in its own right. Most headquarters, of course, were static most of the, these wars, so they were able to exploit large quantities of secure bandwidth and processing power. Now, the multinational nature of operations inevitably created frictions, particularly those arising from differing limitations on employment of national contingents, the so-called national caveats. Commanders had a key role in minimising these frictions. In Afghanistan, NATO acted as a provider of political legitimacy and generator of forces, and NATO techniques and procedures helped make national contingents more interoperable. War is a multidisciplinary activity. A common theme across both wars at every level was the importance of integration. This applied not only to combined arms military tactics and considerable improvements that were made during the wars in integrating air and land forces and special operations forces and conventional forces, but it also applied to fully integrating all levers of national power, military, intelligence, diplomatic and development. And institutionalising interagency cooperation is likely to be an enduring requirement for governments and for armed forces and for government agencies, but keeping it alive requires sustained effort. Many of the war's military capability lessons are widely relevant. For example, there was often a political dimension to military operations right down to the tactical level, the concept of armed politics. So understanding the situation, particularly the myriad local political and military actors, became as important as the narrower understanding of orders of battle of military hardware that had usually sufficed before 9-11. Previously non-traditional military capabilities, such as language and cultural awareness, became important, increasingly so, and it's likely that these capabilities will be required in future military conflict amongst the people. The challenge is to keep those skills alive in peacetime. Tactical action could have strategic effects. This validated the concept of the strategic corporal. But the war showed that the concept worked both ways. The most strategic corporals were those that abused prisoners at Abu Ghraib, who dealt a killer blow to the legitimacy of the US and its forces. This and the equally disgraceful abuse of prisoners by British troops highlights the importance of getting the basics right applying the Geneva Conventions and requiring military personnel to have an understanding of the rules and values that underpin them. And prisoners and detainees have to be seen as opportunities and potential assets rather than liabilities. Successful stabilisation operations involved the concentration of sufficient ground troops to provide security through the people through a systematic clear hold and build approach. Measures were needed to control population movement it also required expanding and decentralised tactical intelligence. Infantry, armour, artillery and combat engineers attacked insurgent strongholds using combined arms tactics, complemented by reconstruction, development and information operations. The more operations involved local forces, giving an indigenous face to build empathy with the civil population, the better. For these wars, infantry was the most important military capability. The firepower and protected mobility of armoured vehicles was invaluable wherever the terrain allowed, and tactical integration of fixed and rotary winged manned and unmanned air power into land operations greatly increased. Now, tactical combat in both wars ranged in scale from low-level firefights and ambushes and roadside bomb attacks to core-level deliberate operations featuring several divisions. Tactical ground combat at times was in, as intense as that experienced in the Second World War, Korea and Vietnam. Militias and insurgents sought to exploit institutional forces' weaknesses 
and sensitivity to casualties by using asymmetric approaches and tactics, particularly improvised explosive devices often used as roadside bombs. And as the popularity of the war declined in all the troop contributing nations, protection and protective equipment became a much higher priority. Extraordinary efforts were made to protect troops, often reducing their utility. For example, in Afghanistan, all infantry were equipped with handheld mine detectors, and specially organised and sophisticated counter-ID task forces were fielded. And armoured vehicles increased in size, weight and cost. International forces' casualty levels were also reduced by a revolution in battlefield medicine. To reduce collateral damage and civilian casualties, the US and its allies sought to use force with precision and discrimination, requiring highly restrictive rules of engagement and ever-increasing use of precision bombs, missiles and artillery, all linked to increasingly capable intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance and command and control capabilities. There was an exponential growth in aerial surveillance, particularly by unmanned aerial vehicles, drones. There was a greater integration of tactical intelligence with national strategic intelligence, and networking these capabilities allowed all source intelligence analysis to lead the attack on enemy networks. Special operations forces had an increasingly important but not exclusive role in this. The full potential of special operations forces was only realised when their operations were fully integrated with those of conventional forces. But of course, during these wars, international forces enjoyed largely uncontested control of the air and of the electromagnetic spectrum. And they made extensive use of contractors and large operating bases. And those conditions wouldn't necessarily apply in future intervention operations, particularly if mounted at short notice or against a capable state enemy. Insurgents and states that might confront Western forces in the future will be drawing lessons from these wars, and they're likely to include the, va the value of decentralised organisations, of asymmetric approaches, and cheap and simple ways of producing <coughs> casualties, such as IUDs, landmines, sea mines, and low-technology mass-produced light weapons. In both of these wars, the enemy was often more adaptable than the intervening nations, and the pace of, of adaptation by the US, the UK, and many of their allies was often too slow, and this reduced the effectiveness of coalition operations and increased their costs, not just in casualties. <laughs> Why was this? Firstly, I think, overconfidence. In the decade before 9-11, the US, UK and NATO-led military operations largely succeeded. Now, the main reason for this was that the opponents were less capable and motivated. This created overconfidence. Many key decision makers in the US and its allies had been misled by the proponents of the revolution in military affairs, a concept that had not been adequately tested against insurgents. And the US Army and key Western militaries had neglected the study of insurgency and counterinsurgency. Secondly, defence bureaucracies and armed forces, including at times the Pentagon and the UK Ministry of Defence, wanted to continue with business as usual. And I think this was best put by Robert Gates. It was only when Gates imposed a sense of urgency on the Pentagon, on the US Army and the US Air Force, that they began applying the necessary energy and sense of urgency the wars demanded. Now, this isn't a new phenomenon, as bureaucracies always have inertia, but forcing them to recognise that business as usual won't meet the imperatives of the war and that they must adapt to the war that they have, rather than the one they want, is a key role of strategic leaders. The successful adaptations that were made by international forces show that whilst technology can assist with adaptation, the key enablers and barriers are leadership, culture, and mental and organisational agility. For the military, bottom-up adaptation was by units was most successful when it was complemented by top-down, adaptation, direction and support. So what the wars tell us is that leading adaptation is a core function of politicians, civilian officials, military leaders and commanders at all levels, but particularly at the top levels. And energising military command chains and defence bureaucracies will be an enduring challenge. The wars confirmed the inherent unpredictability of war, where the enemy has a vote and may fight to the death to cast it. 
They show that war is a clash of wills between actors seeking to shape events to suit their aims, to gain and exploit all the advantages they can. And during the wars, attrition, manoeuvre, symmetric and asymmetric approaches all had their roles. And there were action-reaction dynamics on all sides, where improvements in tactics and capability by one side were checked by a counter-improvement by the other. Both of the short regime change campaigns can be seen as essentially linear conflicts, but subsequent post-conflict stabilisation campaigns were very complex non-linear campaigns with many variables which interacted with each other in changing ways. For example, in Iraq there was a considerable overlap between sheer militias, organised criminals, political and religious extremists and death squads, and in both countries crime and extortion often funded insurgent activity. So military operations were overlaid with complex, multiple political, religious, ethnic and economic conflicts. And the strategic, op operational and tactical levels often overlapped. And this meant that a high degree of complexity endured throughout the wars and was felt at every level of command. General Petraeus is quoted as saying that war is a linear phenomenon. It's a calculus, not arithmetic. Or as British Lieutenant General Graham Lamb, then Deputy Commander of Multinational Forces Iraq, put it in 2007, this is as complex as anything I've ever done. This is three-dimensional chess in a dark room. Now at the time, many commentators often saw the wars as conforming to the concept of the three-block war. And this was described in 1999 by then US Marine Corps General Charles Krulak as contingencies in which Marines may be confronted by the entire spectrum of tactical challenges in the span of a few hours and within the space of three contiguous city blocks. Now this certainly applied to the British attack into Basra province early in the Iraq war. At one point, for example, the British had besieged Basra city and were attacking it with airstrikes, indirect fire and raids by ground troops, while simultaneously conducting stabilisation operations in the town of al Zubaya as well as arranging for the distribution of humanitarian supplies. But Iraq became much more complex than that. For example, in the latter stages of 2008, HQ Multinational Forces Iraq in Baghdad was actually running the following lines of activity. It was attacking Sunni and Al-Qaeda insurgents in the Baghdad belts. It was countering Shia special groups in Baghdad and Basra. It was growing, training and equipping the Iraqi security forces it was administering the Sons of Iraq Sunni militias. It was mentoring the Iraqi government ministries of defense and interior. It was seeking to persuade the Iraqi prime minister to employ its forces in ways that reinforced political progress rather than inhibited it. It was attempting to reduce friction between the Iraqi security forces and the Kurdish Peshmerga units by deploying US forces essentially in a peacekeeping role between the two. And it was also seeking to avoid Kurdistan being destabilised by Turkish airstrikes against PKK guerrillas based in northern Iraq. And this involved sharing intelligence and drone imagery with Ankara. So three blocks of war had increased over five years to eight blocks of war. The war in Afghanistan was just as complex. So these wars were less the three block war, but more like the N block war where N was the sum number of enemy-friendly interagency and neutral lines of action. And I think this is probably an enduring trend. Now, the operations were largely amongst the people in urban areas or the densely populated breadbaskets of southern Afghanistan. They were cont contests for people's minds, the populations, insurgents, militias and their leaders. The established principles of insurgency and counterinsurgency applied. And these included the primacy of politics, addressing the root grievances that caused the insurgency, and making progress across governance and development. And the war showed the importance of achieving legitimacy and operating in accordance with the law. International forces often struggled to achieve this, and it was exacerbated, particularly initially, by inadequate understanding, poor intelligence, and ab abuse of detainees, and some counterproductive tactics. Now, often characterised by British officers as armed politics, the prolonged and difficult campaigns in both country, countries um, were principally um, battles for the narrative. 
and they had a political dimension right down to the tactical level. And this interpenetration and interdependence of war and politics was amplified through 21st century communications. And 21st century communications, satellite TV and latterly the internet and social media, increasingly accelerated passage of information of various degrees of truth, rumour and falsehood. And insurgents were good at using the internet and satellite television to get their message across, making the propaganda of the deed an integral part of their operations. Coalition information operations were initially under-resourced, more constrained and much slower, so the advantage usually lay with the insurgents. But the battle of the narrative became increasingly important, often as important as the military dimension to the conflict, sometimes more so. And this is a trend I see continuing in the future, with information operations needing to be treated as central to military operations, to manoeuvre in the modern information environment as armed forces have conventionally manoeuvred in land, sea or air. And in some cases, achieving influence or an information objective will be equally as important or even more important an objective as destroying enemies and securing terrain. This will be the core business of future military commanders. Now the book suggests some ideas that might help those grappling with the challenges of understanding current and future war. And I hope particularly the book's analysis of armed politics, the battle of the narrative, the end block war and learning under fire might help. An alternative way to see the, um, the wars might be to take the classic military writings of Clausewitz, lay on top of them uh, the writings of Hobbes, Machiavelli, <laughs> and the more recent book, The Utility of Force, by General Sir Rupert Smith. And on top of that, that pile lay box sets of the TV series House of Cards and Game of Thrones. <laughs> but I think you'll find my books slimmer, lighter, and cheaper. Now, the wars showed for the future that if successful regime change isn't followed by successful stabilisation, the consequences can be as bad, if not worse, than those the regime change was originally intended to create. And, of course, that might well apply to any confrontation between the DPRK uh, and the United States and its allies. The wars don't prove that coin is impossible, but rather what they demonstrate is that many of the decisions made by the US and its allies made the wars even more difficult than they might have been. And of course, what we've seen as a reaction is Western governments increasingly seeking to avoid similarly costly and unpopular interventions by leaning forward to build the security capacities of fragile and failing states so that they can better counter insurgency, terrorism and hybrid threats. But that's not just a military effort, it's a security effort and has to be a whole of government effort. Um, now, the credibility and effectiveness of the military component of such assistance will depend on those armed forces' demonstrable combat effectiveness and their understanding of countering insurgency and terrorism. Despite the unpopularity of the Iraq and Afghan wars, the preponderance of interstate conflict, for example, as exhibited in the ISS's recently published Armed Conflict Survey, suggests that any country that assumes that counterinsurgency capabilities aren't required in the future is making an assumption that carries considerable risk. And our, my view is that armed forces require a critical mass of understanding, capability and skills so that they can generate a counterinsurgency and an interagency capability in the future and capabilities that will also be very useful uh, for hybrid threats and hybrid conflicts. That's it. Ben, thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Uh, anyone would like to ask the first question? Grand development is just, just wait for the no, microphone. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Grand development from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Um, this idea the, the, of how close um, we were to strategic defeats, particularly in Afghanistan, um, given what we're seeing in Afghanistan today, what would strategic defeat in Afghanistan tomorrow look like? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, what you've got in Afghanistan now is a mutually hurting stalemate, albeit one in which the majority of territory is still controlled by the government. But the government has not been, government forces have not been able to land a killer blow on the Taliban, and the Taliban, despite 
it's particularly its mass casualty attacks, hasn't been able to manoeuvre government forces out of provincial capitals for any length, length of time. Um, and this is reinforced by the information effect of those spectacular attacks, partic particularly in, in Kabul. On the other hand, there has been some progress, for example, uh, US drone strikes, special operations forces and Afghan attacks appear to have taken down about two thirds of the combat power of Daesh in, Nang in Nangarhar province. And that's you know, had impact in Afghanistan and potentially region, regional impact. Um, I think, you know, politi politics is at the centre center of things. And if the national unity government can reduce its inherent political tension and can continue to bear down on corruption, malign patronage networks, <laughs> and also give um, the Afghan security forces the support they need, um, there is a fair chance of them continuing to hold the ring. Well, a fair chance of what? Fair chance. A fairer or a fair chance? Well, we're, to you know, we're talking about the future. Mm. I think it's pretty clear that General Nicholson, who commands both US forces in Afghanistan and NATO's Resolute Support Mission, has a very clear, clear idea of what he'd do with several thousand more US and NATO troops, enabling them to deploy further forward in terms of training, advising, and assisting, and also giving them more assistant with, assistance with airstrikes and precision strikes. Indeed, we've seen that happen in the campaign against Daesh, where um, President Trump has allowed um, more proactive operations by US advisors and um, allowed better integrated use of US airstrikes and US artillery, which has certainly um, helped push Daesh back both in northern Syria and in and around Mosul. So that illustrates that an increased number of advisors with more power to go closer to the front, better integrated with air power and potentially artillery, could help help um, push the Taliban back. But at the heart of this is politics, both the internal politics of the National Uni Unity Government and the prospect of some sort of settlement between the Afghan government and a significant portion of the Taliban. Okay, uh, gentleman in the aisle, please, and then we'll come to you, sir. Uh, this gentleman, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm Paul Evans from the University of British Columbia and do a lot of work with uh, our forces who are in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm curious, the, you, when you painted your picture near the end of Clausewitz to Hobbes as kind of necessary reading uh, for someone going into future conflicts like this, I was scratching my head because I wondered the flip side of that. Who do we need to know better inside the opposition in Afghanistan and Iraq? How do they learn the lessons of their war? Why were they able to adapt more quickly? One of the advantages of Western countries is we're able to compare knowledge across conflicts. The lessons in Vietnam mean something to the Americans at later battles in other parts of the world. But now that we have certain kinds of insurgents, that are passing techniques, information, how to do warfare from the other side. Look, looking back on your experience, if you were writing a book uh, from the perspective of those you were fighting against, what would it look like? Several um, Western commentators and academics have done good work to try and understand both Shia militias and the Taliban, for example, our colleague Toby Dodge, who's an Iraq expert, who, 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 work, who is a part-time consulting uh, fellow of the ISS, has done good, good work on this. In, in the book, there's a whole chapter on learning under fire, and there are four case studies. There's strengths and weaknesses of the UK, strengths and weaknesses of the US. There's also the excellent example of the way Canada rapidly uh, fielded uh, leopard tanks in um, southern, Af southern Afghanistan as part of the lessons learned from the extremely hard fighting of Operation Medusa in 2006. But the very first example I, I cover insurgent 
and militia learning. Um, many British experts, um, particularly on the um, explosive ordnance disposal and IED side, were quite surprised that the sheer militias in southern Iraq in the best part of 18 months seemed to learn as rapidly as the IRA had learned in 20 or 30 years in Northern Ireland. Well, they shouldn't have been surprised about that because there was rapid expertise transfer from Lebanese Hezbollah and the internet made learning uh, much easier. I mean, the other thing to, to be said is that, that learning under fire is a process of trial and error, working out what works, working out what doesn't, and then exploiting what, what works. Um, it's also a function, a function of leadership, and um, when both parties are trying to adapt against each other, that's when it gets really, cha really challenging, challenging for both. I don't think there's any silver bullet. Um, I think you'll find the, exam the, the chapter and the examples I, I um, use in the book quite interesting. I have also, in my work in the ISS, been doing separate work on military innovation and, and adaptation. And it seems to me that the, 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 the single most important thing is leadership. Because actually for a military leader, particularly at the, at the senior level, it's quite difficult sometimes to shake us aside peacetime preconceptions, um, to recognise when the assumptions on which you've based your planning have, ch have changed. And there's a sort of unique combination of openness, of willingness to change, of identifying in the organisation where change is being made that works, and then spreading and promoting it. Um, at times, the US and the UK, for example, struggled with this. At other times, they succeeded quite brilliantly. I think your question of who should we, who should we be thinking of in the opposition well, is quite clear. It's the senior leaders. And at the local level, it's it's the middle rank, it's the middle ranking leaders, and there's no shortage for an expert understanding of them, uh, built up from intelligence, both intelligence coming down from the top national strategic intelligence, but also tactical military intelligence, gaining a feel and understanding. Hi, I'm Mushad Zedi. I, I write a newspaper column in Pakistan, uh, among other things. I. My question was originally slightly different, but just based on what you just talked about leadership, it's slightly modified. Eric Prince recently wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal calling for a complete complete transformation of the US approach to the war in Afghanistan. And one of the things he talks about is leadership and the centralization of all power in, in a viceroy-like character a la MacArthur uh, in Japan. At some point, I don't know anything about that, but your conclu conclusive slides, one of the things you talked about was the integration of all elements of national power. And it is true, uh, whatever, whatever analysis we derive from, from that fact, but there have been, uh, I believe it's 17 different commanders uh, that the US has fielded in Afghanistan over, over 15 years. So I just wonder, if, if we're talking about leadership on the other side, and you know we have seen the drama of uh, of several high high profile U.S. leaders in Afghanistan that uh, that, that may have been at at, at worst uh, or or at best mere distractions, but you know sort of serious crises. There was the Galbraith versus the Commander versus the Karzai era. There, there's always been uh, a lot of drama around U.S. leadership. To what extent would you would you ex would you connect? failure in Afghanistan with, with failure of coherent, consistent, and integrated leadership uh, in Afghanistan? That's a very good question. I, I think in the book I see this at two levels. First of all, there are examples of the senior US theater commander in a country getting on really well with the US amb ambassador, who of course was a key political figure. And the two examples that come to mind is General Barno and Ambassador Kililzad in Afghanistan 2003 to 2005 and General Petraeus and Ambassador Crocker. At the opposite of this was Mr Bremer and General Sanchez in Iraq in 2003-2004 who really most of the time did not get on. Um, and that's one of the reasons I say why military, high military commanders have to have a very high level of interpersonal, interpersonal skills. 
It's also really important why, bo why both appointments headquarters, you know, the military headquarters and the embassy, must be capable of allowing their chiefs, their commanders, to act at the strategic level with the headquarters running the detail and keeping the enormous amount of mach machinery going. I think, though, there's also a question of failure at, at the national strategic level. Because there's no doubt, you, you know, there are many examples of poor judgment calls in Washington, D.C., and for that matter in London, particularly in the early parts of both wars. Now, what's quite remarkable about President Bush is that having, if you like, presided over a load of poor judgment calls, in 2006, he then went against the majority of advice he was receiving from the national security machinery, but sought advice from outside experts and decided to go for the surge and appoint a new commander to lead it. To lead it. And in a sense, that was a grand recovery in parts. Um, in the book, I give several examples which are, uh, which are based on evidence that's well documented in the UK's independent Iraq inquiry of really suboptimal leadership by Prime Minister Tony Blair, particularly uh, despite taking, uh, making what, are, what turned out to be sound judgments and taking decisions that things should happen, then not following through and ensuring that they did happen. And I think um, both wars are full of rich examples of positive and negative leadership, both military and, and civilian, at, at all levels. Yeah, it's time for a trial by former boss. Uh, David Richards, please. Um, well, well done, Ben. Um, I've written a brilliant endorsement of your book. Uh, General Richards, I was the first com ISAF to command the whole uh, of the NATO operation in Afghanistan. Often forgotten, interestingly, that uh, and the Pakistani question only talked about Americans. Um, but just as a little history lesson, uh, America was focusing on Iraq in 2004, and NATO agreed to take on the task, and I was the, the chap that got it. Um, but my question is, is actually a, um, rather linked to what you've just heard. Um, you haven't anywhere um, here, anyway today, mentioned the importance of mass. Uh, I think in counterinsurgency operations, mass still matters. Um, I wonder if you could comment on that, uh, also in the context of the surge, because uh, like you mentioned President Bush's decision in the case of Iraq, in 2008-9, President Obama did the same in Afghanistan, uh, yet in the same breath said we're coming out at the end of 2014. I wonder if you could just link those two issues. And uh, I, I do remember just as quickly going to places in southern Afghanistan once I was chief of defense staff, where I couldn't possibly have gone uh, back when I was Com ISAF in 2006, the sole reason being that we had enough troops for the first time. General, rest assured, the book does talk about the need, the need for mass. You know, the, um, the irreducible need for a minimum number of boots on the ground. Now, the book also mentions that there are things that can be done to improve mass. And mass just it isn't just on the ground, it's also in eyes in the sky or weapons that can be delivered from, delivered from the sky. And a good example of that is the um, rather interesting battle the US fought in 2008 to clear Sadr City with a US brigade and two Iraqi brigades, where they also used walls to control population movement and restrict insur insurgent movement. Uh, but you're right, there's no shortage for mass, whether the mass is international forces, whether it's um, local forces of various kinds, or whether it's as with the sons of Iraq, persuading uh, former opponents to switch, to switch sides. Um, I think uh, with regard to the surge, I mean, you know, the surge did change the balance in Iraq. It, didn't, it wasn't on its own. It was also... Uh, the effect of the sons of Iraq and also the effect actually that by then increasing numbers of increasingly capable Iraqi security forces were coming online. But it was much less time-based than condition, conditions-based. Uh, quite in some respects, the decisive day of the, sur the surge, I mean the surge lasted f for the best part of 18 months, but the decisive moment of it was in autumn 2007 where General Petraeus testified on the hill 
because his, his testimony was able to, if you like, buy time from the Armed Services, Armed Services Committee. Committee. Obama's surge to Afghanistan was much more time, time constrained. Now, ideally, in a campaign like this, that there's a, a refrain, um, the refrain should be end state, not end date. Um, domestic politics is going to have an effect on that, also the ability of countries to generate, generate the forces. But the more initiatives like the surge are time prescribed, uh, the more they have a danger of that, that prescription, that hard right-hand bar barrier on the calendar, reducing their effectiveness. I, I, I don't think there's any w easy way out of that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Viramala Anjaya. I'm from the Jakarta Post English Daily from Indonesia. Uh, I have uh, two questions, but before that I must confess I am not an expert on war matters. Uh, uh, as a layman, I look at uh, the situation because in the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, we, have, uh, we had several insurgencies, rebel movements. They succeeded, they survived, uh, or maybe some failed, but because of the popular support. But this is a new situation. Uh, actually, these Taliban, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, they don't have mass support, but they are surviving on, on the, uh, creating the fear, the terror among the people. So that is a new uh, new aspect, because the people, if you see, I mean, if you uh, put an election, or if you put a survey, no, m many majority of the people, they don't uh, approve, but because uh, they, are, uh, they are forced to support these groups, that is one. It is already 16 years, but one fundamental question is, how Taliban in Afghanistan is surviving? Because a war is a, a very costly affair. Even the U.S. NATO forces, they spend hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, but this small t Taliban group, if, because Afghanistan is a small country, it is not a big, huge country, hardly 30, 40 million people. But how come this Taliban is surviving for the last 16 years, despite of this whole world united against them? But of course, that's why we have to look at the source. Who is supporting? Where they are getting the uh, funds? Where they are getting the arms? Uh, so uh, instead of uh, focusing on the source, cutting the source, you are going on a conventional way to killing the soldiers, on, uh, these rebels only. So that may not solve the problem. That is one question. That is part of the one question. The second one is, uh, I think in both cases, Afghanistan as well as Iraq, the U.S. and uh, its allies only looked at uh, changing the regimes, but they didn't prepare uh, who will, what will happen? This is a valuable lesson we can learn fr uh, from these two wars. That they didn't prepare who will lead and who will be the uh, uh, most uh, uh, popular governments. They only rush into just change the government, to throw the Taliban out, and uh, they created a mess. In Iraq also, they they thrown out the Saddam Hussein. They created a mess. So this is a valuable lesson. How do you look at these two aspects? Thank you. Well, well, of course, your country did achieve in independence and statehood yeah. by virtue of a nation, national in yeah. surg insurgency. Um, your second question first. I think you do have to be fair to the US and its allies. Is no one, before 9-11, no one had ever th really thought in defence ministries or intelligence agencies that they would have to do a regime change in, in, in operation in Afghanistan and then subsequently sta stabilize it. Um, an effort, quite an effort was made to set the country on the right path after the fall of the Talib Taliban regime. There was the bomb process, there was the writing of a constitution, and major powers all signed up to play leading, leading roles in it. What I think we can say in retrospect is that even in 2002, the US, the UK, and then some of the important allies, their attention, their intellectual horsepower, their bandwidth, the efforts of their military, their intelligence agencies, and their development agencies, were all sucked into the ever-increasing crisis in Iraq. Now, in the case of Iraq, there's plenty of documentary evidence that whilst the regime change there was thoroughly planned, um, the planning for um, stabilisation operations the day after was inadequately planned, partly on the basis 
of over-optimistic over -optimistic assumptions. And what, what delayed an appropriate reaction to the changing conditions by the US and its allies was not recognising quickly enough that the situation had changed in such a way that those original assumptions were, in, were invalid. Uh, your first question, I mean, th there are whole books that have been written in answer to your first question. The way I see it is that insurgents often exploit legitimate grievances. So, for example, the Sunnis in Iraq after the regime change felt very vulner vulnerable because they who had run the country were now being mar marginalised. And as the ethno-sectarian tension in Iraq increased, they felt ever more vulnerable, which um, gave al-Qaeda its real, real, op real opportunity. Similarly, predatory behaviour at the local level by Afghan government officials, including police and tax collectors, has fed resent resentment that has led to support for the Taliban. Indeed, in the book, I quote an American expert on just one district in Afghanistan, Garm Seer, who analysed these dynamics in, in Garm Seer very effectively during the two years he served there with the US, US Marines. So I think um, insurgents, insurgents aren't random. They, they, you know, they don't come out of nowhere. There, there are root causes to insurgencies that, that are exploited by insurgents and terrorism. And the key to countering insurgents and terrorism is not only to provide the security response, but the political, the development, the econo economic response that can help deal with those root causes. Mark Fitzpatrick, please. Thanks, Ben. At the very beginning of your presentation, you made a comment about, uh, if I recall, something about the applicability of, of lessons to this part of the world. And I think about war in this part of the world, in, in, um, in the Asia Pacific, the most likely war I expect would be on the Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And it would likely be a very different kind of war than those that you've examined in your book. Most analysts assume that it would be a, a massive kind of war, uh, short in duration, very bloody, massive casualties. One lesson that I've immediately drawn myself is that it might not be over so quickly. There might be an, ins an insurgency, in which case many of the lessons that you've drawn up uh, might apply. But I'm just wondering if you can comment at all as you look to a Korean situation, any particular uh, lessons that you think apply there? Well, I think, as you've identified, Mark, the first one is a lot of wars start with many of the key participants thinking they're going to be short and sharp and they then can last much longer, they can have a long, long tail. I think I, I've been to South Korea and seen the, ter the terrain throughout the, the area south of the DMZ and also the west and south of the country. Much of that terrain is as challenging, particularly as the US found in regional command east. So many of the capabilities they had to operate, particularly use of, use of helicopters um, and air power and um, you know, there are going to be opportunities and constraints there. I think also um, urbanisation is going to be a key factor in, in the combat. And actually the, the combat in Iraq and Afghanistan, but particularly in Iraq, is rich in lessons to urban warfare. For example, the value of armour, uh, the value of integrating armour, uh, precision artillery, tactical air power and uh, combat engineers right down at the, le the lowest level. You know, for example, one suspicion, suspicion is that based on what we've seen in Iraq, um, engineers, combat engineers, are going to be a key, key constraint on the ability of both sides, sides to manoeuvre. I also think that, that there are many tools that were developed for the air war or the air element of, of the, both conflicts that would be applicable to the uh, a, a career scenario. For example, um, intelligence from the air, precision strike, use of, use of drones, um, but albeit in a much more contested environment, a more contested airspace, more contested electromagnetically, and an, uh, an environment also where the DPRK has this, these vast quantities of artillery, mortars and rocket, rocket launchers, 
which didn't really feature. But um, I think if there, you know, we don't want to see a war in the in the Korean Peninsula. I think the uh, military forces of the DPRK will have done a professional analysis of what they perceive as the strengths and weaknesses of, 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 of the US and the US way of war. Um, but I think many of the um, approaches used in Iraq and Afghanistan will be at least in part relevant. I think the other thing that's relevant, particularly to the armed forces of the US, the US Navy, the US Air Force, and the US Marine Corps, is they've got several generations of the brightest and best that have learnt their trade under fire in really difficult cir circumstances, and that will have given them great confidence, provided they don't misapply wrong lessons. Uh, gentleman in the third row, please. Surya Narayan from the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. There's been much talk about the Pakistan, Afghanistan, cross-border terrorist infiltration to and fro. I mean, something like cross-border terrorist traffic, for want of a better word. I wonder how much of that has been addressed in your book. And secondly, with regard to Iraq, the fact that the weapons of mass destruction were never dis discovered, the missing weapons of mass destruction, was that an element of a moral destabilizer for the, for, you know, US-led forces, thank you. Let's go with that last bit first. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that the failure to find the weapons of mass destruction w was a major blow to the legitimacy of the Iraq war and you know the, the ability of the US and the coalition to counter that, particularly internationally and domestically in the troop contributing nations, was um, it was difficult for them, and it, it actually contaminated the war in Afghanistan as well. Certainly, in the case in the case of UK, I'm afraid, you know, despite best efforts of the UK Ministry of Defence and political leadership to play, to paint paint the British war in Afghanistan as a good war, there were such doubts in the minds of the British media, many politicians, and the public that it sort of had a negative a negative effect on that. Um, one of the issues I didn't really cover in the book, but partly for lack of space, was border security. But it's very simply covered. You know, the coalition was never able to adequately control the border between Iraq and Syria, uh, and the border between Iraq and Iran. And the Afghan-Pakistan border uh, has also been impossible in practical terms to control throughout it, throughout its length. I think what has changed, though, I was in Pakistan two months ago. And we have an extensive South Asia program in the Institute. In fact, Rahul Roy Chowdhury, who leads it, will, will be um, at the conference. But what has changed in Pakistan is they're now making a really determined effort to shut the border. They're reducing the number of um, legal crossing points down to eight. They're building very modern, fortified, high-tech uh, frontier posts at those crossing points. They're greatly increasing the size of the frontier corps and the number of posts, posts on the border. Um, and it seems to me that they are deadly serious about this and applying uh, quite considerable resources. It's difficult though right now on the other side because of course the Afghan forces are struggling to hold the areas they're holding so they don't have much presence on the border. But I am encouraged that there is still, uh, despite considerable political tension between Afghanistan and Pakistan, there is a degree of, of military to military cooperation uh, that practically does still seem to be going on, at least did when I was there two months ago. Thank you. Our final question goes to the lady at the back, please. Um, hello, my name is Sherilyn. I'm from Malaysia. I'm a reporter for NHK Japan. Um, as a media observer, I have this question. Uh, I think that um, there is a problem in terms of our economic model um, you mentioned that it's pro probably because of poverty that people turn to terrorism, right? Um, I mean, it, well, from what we understand. So do you think that um, the, the event 
for Shangri-La dialogue this time should be focused on economic model to be introduced for humanity as a whole, rather than to study military actions and strategies. So, okay. We have a geo-economic program, which I'm afraid with no economic qualifications, I'm not a, mem I'm not a member of, but we do do quite a lot of geo-economic geo work. And our security and development program also looks at the nexus, the relationship between security, uh, security and development. Um, what I would say is, um, yes, I, I mean, poverty can be a driver to insurgency and terrorism, but what I think we saw at times in Afghanistan was not so much poverty, but the way people's incomes were eroded by uh, petty corruption at a low level um, from Afga low level Afghan government. But, uh, officials or being shaken down at police check police checkpoints. There is no doubt, though, that in both conflicts there was an economic di di dimension. For example, the British, assisted by agricultural experts from Denmark early in Iraq, identified the tomato crop, crop as being critical uh, to the economy of southern Iraq and made considerable efforts to try and make sure that in 2003-2004 uh, the tomato sector of agriculture was self was self self sustaining, and I think in my talk I did mention that that you know economic development, which of course includes measures to reduce poverty, is a very important part of the interagency action that's necessary to counter insurgencies. Okay, thank you. I'll leave it there. Um, at five thirty today, back here, uh, my colleague uh, Tim Huxley and, and and some others are launching the Asia Pacific Regional Security Assessment. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for coming today and for asking your questions, and uh, I ask you to join me in thanking Ben.